You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. Hey everyone, I'm here with Adrian Liar and uh, we're here to talk a little bit about Adrian's journey and the work that he's doing. He's a fascinating guy uh, and I'm so glad that I could bring him to you. Adrian, it's good to have you. Say hello. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, well, super pumped about this. I'm having a chat with the godfather of sketchnoting. How great is that? Yeah. It's an offer you can't refuse, right, if I go with the theme? <laughs> 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 but uh, seriously, though, um, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm I'm pretty new to understanding about you. I've seen you with working with Ben Felis a little bit, and I thought, this has got to be a cool guy. So, um, and I started looking at your work and it looked amazing. And I thought, you know, we need to have Adrian on, on the show and hear from him and what he's up to. So tell us who you are and what you do. Thank you. And, and Ben is a, is a really cool guy. Uh, so my name is Adrien Lia. I'm, I'm French, as you can probably tell from, from my accent. I grew up in Paris, but I'm now based in Toulouse, uh, a lovely city in the southwest of the country. Mm. I'm a father of twins, uh, and I've been many things in my career. I started as a software developer and data engineer. Then I became a Scrum Master, a product owner, finally a, a product director, mainly in the market research industry. And these days, I'm also trying to develop a small but steady growing business as a graphic recorder. That is, uh, I draw while people talk, and I mm -hmm. focus mainly on digital graphic recording. Uh, so to put it simply, my job is to make Zoom meetings and webinar more effective, human, fun, memorable, by capturing visually the ideas and insights that are being shared while the discussion uh, happen uh, live. Mm. So I guess that's it. That's really that's really fascinating. And um, I'm always curious to hear, how did you arrive at this place where you're doing this graphic recording? Was there something in your childhood that sort of led you to this? Have you drawn ever since you were a kid? Like, how did you end up here? It's always really fascinating to hear the path and the journey that people take to arrive to where we are now. Well, I have always been drawing, <laughs> yes. Uh, I used to draw a lot, like a lot as a kid, uh, like a lot of people, I guess, but I never stopped and like the majority of people. Uh, and in school, I was always drawing uh, in my notebooks and my notes were uh, not very linear, uh, more, more like all over the page, you know, with text mixed with simple drawings and a lot of random doodles too. Uh, so let's say that my teacher were not really fond of my <laughs> not taking style. <laughs> but it was, you know, working for me. So uh, I, I really tried to take notes in a more classic manner, but uh, it was just not working for me. It was mm. yeah, boring, I think. And a bit later when I was uh, like kind of young, uh, maybe 12 or 13, I became really obsessed with with graffiti, mm -hmm. uh, and I basically spent all my teenage years and college years doing graffiti, writing and painting in the streets mm -hmm. and trains, uh, stuff like that. And it was a really, really good school in terms of what I do now, in terms of graphic recording, because you get to uh, you, you get to, to to be very good at working fast and under mm. pressure, and obviously it is also a good school in terms of lettering and calligraphy because you get to, to practice a lot your your writing skills. And then when I turned uh, 25, when I graduated basically, I started working as a software developer, and I had uh, at that time obviously less and less time to to do graffiti. Uh, mm because it's hard to combine uh, graffiti with work life uh, because you do it at night and you have to show up at work in the morning. You may end up in jail and not be able yeah. to show up at work <laughs> at all. Uh, and you are, yeah, you are like full of paint, your clothes, your hand, and your coworker think you are a weirdo. So, uh, so I had to, <laughs> to put a pause on, on graffiti. But uh, yeah, when I, I think about it, uh, Graffiti was really my art school, basically. Uh, it teach me a lot uh, about mm -hmm. everything I know, uh, about drawing and art in general, about composition, lettering, style, lines, shape, colors. Uh, it also teach me that, yeah, when you, when you really practice something, uh, you, you will eventually get, get better to it if you commit to it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I started my, my career at that time, and I was still uh, using this word note 
taking, take, not taking style. And, and to be honest, I was not really showing uh, them to anyone at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, at that moment, uh, it was ju really just for me. I was even actively trying to hide them uh, because I did not <laughs> want my coworker or my boss to 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 see those funny looking notes. You know, like uh, I was really I was pretty sure that they would think this does not really looks professional or, or serious, you know. Um, and a bit later, I think it was in 2013 or 2014, I stumbled upon a great book, the Sketch Not on Book, your book. And I don't really remember all, uh, but uh, let me tell you that I was literally blown away uh, by, by that, that it was a thing uh, with a name and with a community of people around the world doing it. Um, it may seem like simple and trivial, but the fact that you gave it this catchy and easy to remember name made it easy to search it online and to find mm. another people and find examples online. And seriously, uh, if it was me, uh, I think you, you deserve a Nobel Prize for that uh, because you, you literally <laughs> you. changed my life and I think the life of, of many other people. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I started to be more and more interested in the, in the form and aesthetic of sketch, sketch noting as well. Because for me, obviously, at first, it was a, a thinking tool, uh, something uh, mm -hmm. that helped me to record meetings and structure my ideas. But this way of mixing uh, simple drawing with text uh, was really appealing to me uh, coming from mm -hmm. graffiti. So I started to practice and experiment with it uh, a bit more. And around that time, uh, I also discovered Agile uh, at work. Uh, so maybe listener of the show uh, not familiar with Agile, but let's say that it's a set of values and principles uh, that emerge from the software development industry mm -hmm. uh, to make collaboration around solving complex problems more, more efficient. And it basically boils down to gather a team, give them a problem to solve, trust them, and encourage them to work in a iterative uh, iterative way with short feedback loops. Build something, show it to the user, learn from it, improve it, and do that over, over and, and over, over again. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure that you are pretty familiar with, with that, yeah. uh, being a, a designer in the software industry. And Agile people, the Agile community, community in general, is um, are really dedicated to find ways to improve collaboration. And obviously, this crowd quickly discovered that visual thinking can help a lot with that. <laughs> Uh, so I made the connection between the two. Uh, at some point, it was really two different universes for me, but I quickly realized that there, was, there are a lot of bridges between the, the two universes. And around the same time, I became a, a Scrum Master, uh, which is a, a role in an Agile team where your job is basically to help uh, the team to improve and help them find better ways to, to collaborate together. And it, I guess it gave me the permission I was waiting for to start sharing my notes, sharing my visual work, mm. uh, because I saw uh, other practitioners uh, do it, other Scrum Master, Agile Coach, and I started to use more and more visual into the workshop I was running with my teams and my clients. And yeah, the, the feedback was, was great. <laughs> People were really happy with it. Uh, so I kept looking for ways to incorporate visual tools into my daily work because uh, it was working and because honestly it was fun to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also started sharing some work online at that time, uh, mainly sketch notes about books or conference I had read or, or watched, things like that. And I started to get yeah, requests from people who were asking me if I could do the same for them. And at first I was just saying, no, thank you. <laughs> I have a full-time job, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but really, I think I was just thinking that I was not good enough to be paid for it, you know. So I kept practicing uh, more and more. And at some point, I said yes to someone because they were really pushy. And <laughs> those first clients recommended me to other clients. And I started to share more of my work online and social media mainly. And it started to become... Uh, LC, small but growing side business. And yes, this is where I, where I am today, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a really fascinating story. And the, the interesting overlap too of uh, Agile and sketchnoting, I noticed it right away because I was in that space too as a designer. And I was finding like, what are ways that I can make use of this visualization technique 
in uh, in the work that I'm doing, right? So for me, it expressed it expressed itself on a whiteboard uh, where we did basically did whiteboarding sessions uh, for wireframes for the software we were building. So we had a giant whiteboard. I would pick two colors typically. We would queue up some feature. We would talk about what the feature looked like because we were migrating from an old tool to making a new one. We would look at what the old tool did. What do we like? What do we not like? What are some ideas? And then we would start talking and I would draw as people would speak on the board. And that was a really valuable experience for that team because they really uh, saw and experienced being part of the process, watching their Mm -hmm. ideas being drawn on the board, like immediately. Uh, I know that I have one developer, Ian, who constantly said, uh, how are you reading my mind? <laughs> like, I'm just listening to what you're saying. So I have enough, you know, I have enough fluency in understanding what development looks like that I can draw it. Like I'm not a developer, but I can imagine it. And so that was a really fun experience to see how the two could overlap. But there's many other overlaps. There's lots of agile people sure. in this community, as I'm sure you've discovered over time, right? Yeah, who, yeah, yeah. Who really? So that's really great to hear that another person from the agile space who is crossing over. I get, I ha, you, you, it's hard to deny that it's not some kind of a common thing that these mm-hmm. two yeah, are is. related or at least interact well together. So that's really great to hear. Yep, yep. It, it, seems ob, uh, it seemed obvious to you uh, uh, at that time, but for me, to be honest, it was not. And I had to discover that, oh yeah, this is really a good way to, mm. to yeah, to collaborate and to, build this shared understanding that is really, really uh, uh, powerful when you are trying to solve a problem together. You need to make sure that you have like, yeah, this shared understanding that you are trying to solve the same problem that you are mm-hmm. understanding, mm-hmm. Uh, and even if you have different perspective. And yeah, visual are really uh, powerful to, to do that, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other thing that I, that I touch on again is, um, so we talked a little bit, we mentioned uh, Ben Felis. He's also a graffiti artist as a kid, yep. so I'm sure that you discovered that having worked together with him. Yeah. And yeah, there's, there is, the, I guess the other thing I would say is um, your styles have some connection or relationship. When I look at them, they feel like, like if I, if I knew that Ben was a, a graffiti guy, maybe, maybe Adrian is as well. Like when I look, I, like I wouldn't have known it. Like if I looked at your work, I wouldn't say, oh, he yeah. must be a graffiti artist. But now that you yeah, say yeah. it, it's like, oh, this, yeah, that makes sense. Yep, that that fits, right? Yeah, obviously, this is something that uh, make, uh, yeah, we certainly when we made friends with uh, with Benjamin, this is some, some, certainly something we talk about. Uh, the fact that we have both a, a background in graffiti, and yeah, I think it shows in our work. Uh, uh, um, the scale of Benj- of Ben's work is yeah. really telling uh, because he likes to work big, like every graffiti artist. Uh, or style of uh, of lettering, I think, is is yeah. really a, a clue too. Uh, and the fact that yeah, we like to work fast and under pressure. We are mm-hmm. uh, we are looking for that pressure. We yeah. I think we we really really like that to 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 have to work uh, in a yeah really really quick way i think this is exciting for us and i think we we've bonded over this too mm-hmm. so yeah that makes me think and this is just just came up because we were talking about this could there be something around graphic recording sketch noting where you can find kids who maybe don't know what they want to do they're maybe lost in the system the one thing that connects them is this graffiti that they do but it can constantly gets them in trouble right is there a path could you like my thinking goes to is there like a whole group of really talented graphic recorders just waiting to be uh, developed in the graffiti world? Like you could go out and find these kids and they have all the skills. They love the pressure. They like all the things you talked about. If you could take that, that power and that talent and redirect it toward something they can get paid for, that they can enjoy, that takes advantage. Like it seems like there's a, a whole pipeline <laughs> of potential candidates in this community if you could like probably the hardest thing is to convince them that it's uh, interesting and fun to do right maybe you know i think ben said he got to a certain age where where it didn't make sense anymore you talked about the same that maybe there's just a tipping point where like okay if i continue on this path it's not going to end well so what can i do you have to get them at that point 
if you get them too early, maybe they don't believe you, right? I don't, you know, if you look back at yourself when you're 16, like, would you have believed your, would it, would you have believed yourself if you came to you and said, "Hey, no, no, right, definitely not, definitely not." I think, <laughs> I, I think uh, it would have sound really cool to me uh, to be paid to, to to just draw what people say uh, and to be paid for that. I think I uh, would, I think that really funny and really great and really cool, uh, but. At that time, I think I was <laughs> really more interested in doing yeah. the work outside Not in the really. street for, for yeah. everyone to to see it. Uh, but yeah, really now um, that I'm looking backward and I'm able to yeah, connect the dots, you know, I, yeah, obviously everything I learned there uh, is really helping me now. And we are, yeah, Ben is a good example of that, but there is many other, uh, maybe I can... Um, name uh, Yobi from Bologna, an amazing graphic mm. recorder too, uh, who, who has a background in graffiti too. So mm. there is several of us. Uh, and yeah, I think we share some uh, some similarities in our style and, and our approach. But mm. yeah, I think yeah, the, the fact that graffiti te- teach you uh, those lettering skiing, working really quickly under pressure is like, yeah, uh, if you had to design a school to be a graphic recorder, uh, <laughs> doing graffiti would be a pretty good solution to that problem, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could structure a whole school around this, right? You could take uh, ex graffiti guys who know what to look for and build a school. Maybe, maybe the school is like, um, your attendance doesn't cost you much, but you have to be there, right? And then you get trained by these people who used to be graffiti people to sort of take the skills you have and translate it. And then, you know, sort of sort of uh, tame the wild stallions, I guess, maybe you would say in some sense. But Sounds like a terrific idea, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think Let's do it that. Seems like there's, there's some opportunity there, right? Maybe, maybe there's a prize or something that they win or I don't know. But um, anyway. I'm, I'm taking so, notes right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reminding you for the question of the day. Great. I'll say the clock. Oh, okay. I'm going to cut I'm going to cut this part out. Alec cut this part out. That's I'm the, reminding you. The downside of uh downside of using Alexa is she suddenly talks when you least expect it. <laughs> <laughs> I know I could cut this from the video too, so. Um Yeah, that's all Okay. Right. So that, that's really fascinating, Adrian. Um, this idea of, you know, graphic uh, graffiti artists having the real potential. Um, so it sounds to me like the thing that you enjoy is uh, if you enjoy the pressure. And I know um, Ben has talked about the same thing, right? The pressure and the excitement and sort of the performance aspect, I guess you might even say, mm-hmm. right? Like I think people who go into this and take any kind of money or do it for a client, even if you don't get paid, like there's something uh, strange about this group of people that are willing to put themselves in the position of like listening and turning these ideas into visuals on the spot, right? There's just something in general, there's a performance aspect to that that you sort of can't deny, right? Um, yep. So um, one of the things I'm curious about, you talked about working large scale. Um, it's interesting that you're doing this graphic recording uh, digitally is there some aspect of your work that is analog as well that maybe we just haven't seen because digital is just the more most natural thing you would share because you're promoting this work and you're looking for customers, right? Is there a analog part of your life that maybe you still maintain that's uh, yeah, tied I, I to do. graffiti as well? Uh, I do, I do. Well, I still paint, uh, not as mm. much as before and in more... Uh, uh, legal settings uh, yeah. because I don't want to take any risk. I have kids and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'm a real fan of sketchbook. I feel a ton mm. of sketchbook, at least one per month. Uh, so I draw a lot and I use mm. all kinds of things. Um, yeah, paint, uh, markers, uh, ink, watercolor. So yeah, analog is a big part uh, of my of my artistic life, I would say. Mm. Uh, mm. But uh, but as I said in the, at the beginning of our conversation, uh, I mainly focus on digital graphic recording uh, mm, okay. in French and in English, uh, because you know with the pandemic, a majority of corporate events have been moved to the digital space to to Zoom meetings and and webinar, and and I think we all suffered from Zoom fatigue at some point, and graphic recording is a really effective way to bring some 
mm-hmm. fun and humanity uh, in those remote events and obviously all the benefits of on-site graphic recording still apply uh, attendees mm-hmm. are more engaged with the content they're more likely to remember the content uh, it's also a really good way to share the ideas that were discussed beyond the actual right. event by sharing the pictures on social media or in photo image so uh but yeah i, I really focus on that uh probably because i started my business uh during during those times mm. <laughs> so i had i had no choice and i'm really interested actually in how you can yeah find better ways to to work remotely uh, this mm. is something that is really interesting to, to me uh, but i also work for audio content creators podcaster um, or more recently shows hosted on clubhouse uh, mm-hmm. Maybe people don't know, are not familiar with what Clubhouse is, but it's a social audio app. So anyone is able to start a room on Clubhouse and discuss yeah, any topic they want, basically. And people are able to easily join the discussion as it happens. So I think it's a really interesting idea. It is very similar to podcasting or radio shows, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you have this ability to, to build and engage a community around it in a very direct way without any filter so i guess yeah all all of it is that digital graphic recording space is really exciting for me so i don't find the need to to really work on other things and Mm -hmm. since uh in uh, in europe things are still pretty bad uh we are still working a lot remotely uh Mm -hmm. there is yeah, tons of space and (laughs) and things to to experiment uh in that space so i don't really feel the need to to work uh, to walk live at the moment. Interesting. I, I suppose the benefit too is uh, the analog stuff now becomes your refuge or the thing you do for fun. It is. And you know, giving yeah. it all away. And a place for experimenting too. Uh, mm-hmm. Like with new, new material, new style. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. And do yeah. other things than sketch noting and, and graphic recording. I think it's really important too, to, mm. to experiment with other things. And we're going to touch on uh, tools. So I think uh, Adrian's going to have some really interesting tools to share with us when we get to that part of the show uh, from his experience in analog. So um, one thing I've been asking, because you mentioned the pandemic, it seems like it's holding on um, and might, you know, changing and we're having to be challenged by it. So if, for us, even in the U.S. here, it feels like, you know, another winter of sort of hunkering down and uh, trying to make it through. So I'm, I'm always curious with the guests now. What are things that you do to help you kind of from going crazy when you're sort of stuck in the house or you're stuck doing, you can't do the normal things that you would normally do. What are some things that you do to help you cope with that? Well, um, obviously we are living some really weird and somewhat scary times. Um, And as a father, I'm really concerned about it. Obviously my sons are really young and the world where they're growing up is kind of really different than the one I grew up with. So, mm-hmm. uh, but still, uh, I think I'm a pretty optimistic person. Uh, and even if this pandemic is causing horrible things and pain all over the world, it, it is also an exciting time to be alive, uh, it's especially when you are a creative person, you know, uh, because the world is changing so fast and is getting more complex creative creativity i think is the most crucial skill to have yeah in the future because creativity is all about working with constraint and finding new new solution to to, to problem that that arise uh, and, and the pandemic and the global shift to to remote work is i think a good example of this uh, i don't really know uh, about the situation in the us we talk a bit about it about uh, before recording but in europe a lot of people are still yeah, working from home, uh, if they can, obviously. Uh, and you can obviously complain uh, that this social distancing uh, thing and working from home have pulled us apart. But I think you can see it in a quite different way. Uh, for sure, the people you were working with every day are no less close to you uh, than they used to be when you were able to work in the same office. But at the same time, all the meetups and community events that were previously held physically uh, all over the world are now online and you are able to attend them. Uh, and previously it was impossible, virtually impossible. Uh, so I'm now able to attend meetups and share ideas with people in London, uh, in Berlin, in Copenhagen, in New York, uh, without having to, to travel. So in a way, I think this pandemic removed the distance 
between us, <laughs> uh, which is a bit, a, 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 a bit of a paradox. But I think this is really exciting uh, that mm. we are able to share ideas, to talk, to meet, to collaborate, and to make friends with people from all over the world. Uh, it's probably even more inclusive uh, since you don't have to live in a big city to participate actively in those communities. Uh, you can be in the middle of nowhere in Europe or in Asia and attend a New York based meetup. You just need an internet connection uh, and a laptop. And even if we, if talking through Zoom is not as good as being in the same room, uh, I like to remember that 10 years ago, the alternative was text-based chat or forums, you know, uh, yeah. and we are not able to see each other, to, to share our screen, to share our drawings, to, to, to draw live, to teach each other in a really interactive manner. So that is really exciting to me. And I think this new world is highly visual too. So, so visual thinking skills and drawing skills are really bringing a lot of value to, to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and remote work is probably here to stay. So we better get used to it and see it as an opportunity rather than mm -hmm. than a no bad problem. thing yeah uh, there is always a good part in pretty much everything right you just have to, to to look for it and what is really exciting is that we are just i think beginning to understand how we can benefit from this yeah ability to collaborate at scale across border and cultures mm -hmm. so everything needs to be reinvented uh, and as visual practitioner uh, we are really in a unique position to help remote work to be more efficient, fun. Uh, we can use tons of visual tools to boost online meetings. We can use obviously graphic recording, uh, digital whiteboarding tools. You can help design online workshops and transform them in a multimedia uh, experience right. with visual, with sound, with video. And, and hybrid events are also something that pose its own challenge and that will probably be a big thing in the, in the future. Um, and we need to experiment with this too and see what works and what does not work. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And to be honest, I spent most of this pandemic time experimenting with those new opportunities and trying to find, yeah, uh, positive positive things to to think about in the middle yeah. of this chaos <laughs> that's a great attitude to have and i think um i felt similar like i i saw pretty quickly that there's an opportunity in 2020 if i was invited to any meetup i just immediately said yes because I, I knew that i needed to get better at presenting on screen um sharing my desk sharing with the i like all those things that i've been kind of playing around with on the edges then I needed to really make it a priority. And so it's really paid off because I feel a lot more confident and comfortable doing it. And I think that's true. Like we always talk about the best way to learn how to draw is to do the drawing, right? There's no substitute for it. So the same case is like, well, we're in this pandemic, we have to use these uh, digital tools to connect. Why don't we just get really good at them, right? So we yep. can make the experience better. And I think that's just a great attitude to have. Is there anything that you do uh, personally? Like um, I've heard people say they spend more time with their kids or bake bread, or is there some kind of yeah. uh, activity you like to do yeah. just to kind as of get I away said, from I'm all this? A, I'm working a lot. And as I mm. said, I'm a father of twins. Uh, so I try to, to spend a lot of time with them. I used to travel a lot uh, mm -hmm. before with my daily job. Uh, like mm -hmm. I think my uh, top record is uh, taking 72 flights in a year. So I was wow. really traveling a lot. And the pandemic ended that. And that's good uh, because I'm able to spend a lot more time with my kids. And they're really young. And I think those moments are really something you need to, to treasure. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a, <laughs> again, you, you, if you want to see the bright side, uh, it has been a blessing for me to be able to, mm. to, to see them grow up. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, spending time with my kids have been the, my most, uh, recurrent activity, I guess. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great to hear. This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, an infinite canvas sketching app built for tablets with a stylus like the iPad Pro, Microsoft Surface, and Samsung Galaxy Tab. Concepts Infinite Canvas lets you spread out and sketch in any direction. Everything you draw in Concepts is a flexible vector, so you can move your notes around the canvas or change their color, tool, or size with a simple gesture. 
Search Concepts in your favorite app store for infinite, flexible sketching. Um, so let's shift a little bit. Now we're going to get to the tools. Yeah. So now, we should, now I can turn you loose and tell us all these really cool things that you can share with us from your analog, and then we'll go into digital. Yeah, okay, analog, uh, cool. Yeah, uh, it's a bit strange because people mostly know me for my digital work, but as I said, I'm actually a big fan of analog drawing. Uh, and when it comes to practice and experimenting, I think that nothing beats making marks on actual surface, something with texture and light reflection, you know, something you can feel, you can touch. Uh, so I'm a big fan of sketchbooks. Uh, I tried, I think, a lot of brands and even tried to bind them myself at some mm. point, uh, but it was really time consuming. Uh, so I used to really like Moleskin, like many people. Then I switched to Lodge Term uh, 1917. I'm not mm -hmm. sure this is the correct way to pronounce the brand. Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but recently, I switched to Wild Talents sketchbook. Mm. Uh, they are really cheap, uh, which is a good thing because I used <laughs> a lot of them. They come in different sizes, and I really like to use different sizes to uh, avoid being used too much to a particular scale, you know. I think that's good. Uh, and the best selling point for me is that the paper is really heavy, so you can mm. basically throw anything at it, ink, gouache, acrylic, Posca, watercolor, anything, you name it. So I can really recommend them. I'm, I'm not paid to, to, to say that. Uh, and uh, in terms of pen and markers, uh, I have to say that I'm really a marker nerd since my graffiti days. So I can talk about marker for, for yeah. ages, but uh, uh, at the time we were even making them ourselves, you know, from scratch, we would empty shoe shine bottles, feed them with ink. We would even cook the ink in order to mm. remove the water from it and make mm -hmm. it more opaque and hard to remove. Mm. I, I don't advise people to do that at all. The chemical <laughs> in inks are really, really bad, but yeah. So yeah, I have this thing for, for, for marker. Uh, so when it comes to graphic recording, obviously Neuron markers are a solid choice, I think. Uh, I especially like their brush nib markers. I think mm. they're called the number one art or something like that. They're mm -hmm. refillable, good grip, yeah, really good stuff. Uh, sometimes I prefer to work with paint rather than with mm. ink because it is more opaque, uh, uh, even if it flows less than ink. Uh, Posca are a solid choice, but I also like uh, the Molotov brand. Uh, mm, yeah. mm -hmm. which used to be a, a brand focused on graffiti writing too, by the way. Uh, and they are acrylic based marker. So the paint is really opaque and they have a huge variety of colors available. So uh, it's a gem brand brand, I think. Uh, I don't know yeah, if I think it's so, easy too. to get them outside of Europe. Uh, so yeah, really like I, them. I buy them at the local store. I haven't done paint markers, but I do have the Molotov black liner. One of my mm, favorite. Yeah, yeah, good ones, one right? too. The yep. one millimeter. I like really bold, strong lines. So fortunately they offer heavy and it's the dark pigment a lot like the neuland mm. uh, yeah, pens, yeah good one which i love as mm. well yeah uh in terms of pens uh while we are talking about pens uh i used to be a big fan of, of fine liners too uh, microns from sakuras are great mm -hmm. uh, but no i can't work with them uh because i'm used to work with brush pen mm. and it's i think really hard to go back on you've started to get used to work with brushes because Brushes are really flexible and the variety mm. of line weights uh, you can get from them is so powerful. So it's really hard to go back to a pen that can give you only one size of line. It mm. feels like really limiting to me now. Um, and my go-to brush pen uh, for small scale work is uh, the Tombow Fudenozuke. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, they those. are excellent. I love those pen. Uh, I'm totally in love with those pens. Uh, they're waterproof, so you can use watercolor and ink on top of them. Uh, I have a big pile of them <laughs> because I'm mm -hmm. too scared to mm -hmm. run out of stuff. Burn you know? through them like, you know, <laughs> like and... wood in the fireplace, right? <laughs> <laughs> and for larger scale work, I love the ABT dual brush pen from Tombow again. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, Multiple colors know. for that one, I think. Yeah, a, lot, a huge variety of color. And yeah, I love them, especially for lettering. I think, mm. uh, yeah, I like. I really like to, to write with them. Uh, for lettering, I also like big ones from Newland. Yeah. You have to go, to go big. Mm -hmm. They're really cool. Uh, 
they have a chisel nib, so you still get a variety of line weights from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, stop me, Mike. I can talk about marker <laughs> for hours. Trust me. <laughs> well, you've given us a good selection. Um, and then I'll have to make sure that you send me a link to the books. So if uh, someone wants to look them up, we can find them and share those, yeah, those sure, books sure, sure, sure. as well. And then as we'll, we'll go through all these, of course, and put them in the show notes as we always do. So you can find the things that Adrian is, is sharing if you want to try them out. Um, yep. And of course, if you have any um, any tutorials, you happen to have tutorials where you share how to use them, that would be fun to share as well. So we'll, we'll make sure and do that uh, when we do the show notes. So no worries. Take a look and... We haven't done them yet, but uh, in the future, which is now for you, uh, the show notes will be there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what about digital? Uh, well, for digital work, my weapon of choice is my iPad Pro uh, and Procreate. Uh, I try to use Fresco, Adobe Fresco, mm -hmm. but I'm really efficient now with Procreate, so it's really hard to switch. Yeah. I could not really manage my, to wrap my head around Fresco. I also tried Concept. And mm -hmm. many other apps actually, but I stick to Procreate. No, it's like, you know, second nature for me. Yeah, the gesture yeah. and shortcuts are already ingrained in me. So yeah. I don't even have to think about it. And that makes me more efficient. And, right. and drawing and focusing on the content at the same time is really hard. So you really need your tools to get out of your way. Uh, but obviously you have to invest tons of hours of practice mm -hmm. in order to get there. So it makes it really hard to switch on Sluv even said so 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 much in a tool and um yeah so ipad and procreate and since my work is really focused on online events i also have uh invested in reliable hardware to make my work more efficient and comfortable so mm -hmm. i have a good headset uh, with noise cancellation i'm not disturbed by the ambient noise i have a document camera mm -hmm. uh, Pivo V4K, I think that's the name. Mm. Uh, uh, so I'm able to show my hands working on the iPad or on paper. Mm -hmm. I also have a video capture card to plug to my iPad, so I'm able to share my screen live. Mm. And I also use some software to make it easy to switch between all those cameras and screen and stream yeah. them and also yeah. record myself. Uh, there is actually a lot of tech involved. <laughs> and yeah, I know. I'm, just I'm, starting, I'm but... in the same space. There's a yeah. lot of technology that, that people don't realize. But as a former software engineer, I have to say that I actually enjoy diving into those yeah. nerdy details. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah that's really great. Um, so let's move to tips now. Um, so the way I frame it in every show is imagine there's someone listening who's into visualization, whatever that means, sketch noting, graphic recording, doodling, nature drawing, could be anything. But they feel like they've hit a plateau. You know, they've been doing the same thing over and over again. You talked about shifting your notebooks. So you don't, that doesn't happen for you. And you do lots of experimentation, right? What would be three tips you would share with someone who's in that place who just wants a spark of an idea to maybe get them out of the groundhog day that they continue to repeat, right? Well, uh, this is, I think, a. Uh a good but very difficult question because it really yeah. depends where you are on your journey uh, but let me try uh, so i think the most basic and universal tips uh, you can give to someone who wants to get better or, or yeah, get over a plateau uh, is practice uh, practice and practice again <laughs> i think this is the best advice you can give but People don't really want to hear that. Uh, they are looking, you know, for the for the shortcuts. What brush are you using? What app are you using? What book did you read? What online course did you follow? Like, if they're trying to find the the, the magic stick, you know, that will make them improve instantly. And and the truth is, there is no shortcut, right? There is no magic stick. You have to practice a lot to get good at this. But I think there is a problem with this advice. Uh, it's good, but there is a problem with it. And this is why I think people get frustrated because you tell people to practice, but you don't tell them oh, uh, and, and what to avoid in order to practice uh, in an effective manner. Uh, you don't really give them example when you do that. And when you're just starting on when you reach a plateau, you, you need, I think, really concrete steps and guidance. Uh, and there is, I think, some principles that you can apply in order to practice in an efficient manner you know uh, first i think that regularity uh, i think is key it is probably better to practice five minutes every day than practice mm. let's say eight hours on some months 
on Cinnamons. Uh, so try to find a, a, system, a sustainable rhythm to, and stick to it. I think quantity is more important than quality when it comes to, to practice, really. If your goal when you practice is to do like the best catch note ever, then the, the probability that you will fail is really high <laughs> and yeah. you will get discouraged and you will stop practicing, which is not a good thing, obviously. Uh, so I think it's better to use quantity uh, as a measure mm. of success. Uh, like, okay, we do one sketch note every day for a whole week. I think that's a, a better goal uh, mm. because even if those sketch notes are pretty bad, the chance that you will learn something is really high. And this is what you are looking for when you are practicing learning, not doing a great piece. And, and as humans, we learn by trial and error. So uh, uh, you don't have to show them, obviously. Uh, they don't have to be good. You just have to stick to your schedule, show up, focus on the quantity, on the number you've set up as your measure of success. So I think that's, yeah, a, a good way. Uh, and one other important thing when it comes to practice is to inspect your work from time mm. to time and try to find areas where you think you need to improve and then try to design experiment and exercises to specifically train those weaknesses you have. Uh, external feedback may help here, but uh, once you've identified those areas of improvement, let's say, uh, you want to focus on, uh, basically you need to do more of what hurts. You know, mm. uh, because this is all you grow muscle by stretching yeah. out of your comfort zone. You know, so let me give you a concrete example of that. Uh, let's say that you are struggling with keeping up with the amount of content when the speaker talks really quickly. Uh, you, find, you think you don't capture enough content, which is something that people ask me often. So let's try to design an exercise to grow that muscle. So what you need to do is to, you need to find speakers that talk really fast. You do, mm -hmm. you need to do more of what hurts. And there is actually a really easy way to do that. You go to YouTube. You find a, a TED talk and you set the playing speed to 2x. You do that for 10 talks, it will hurt. Your sketch note will be very bad, probably. The amount of capture content will be pretty low. But when you will come back to normal speed, it will feel a lot easier because you will have grown that muscle, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, another concrete example you are really bad at drawing, let's say, bikes. Bikes are really hard to draw, right? Uh, what do you do? Well, you do more of what hurts. You go on Google image, you search for bike images, and you draw uh, 100 bikes in your sketchbook. After drawing 100 bikes, you will be better at drawing them, and you will probably be able to draw them from memory, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's helpful. Uh, so that would be my second tip. OK, one last tip uh, that I think is really helpful. Uh, don't do any sketch note or graphic recording. Don't fo focus on one particular type of drawing. Try to expand to other type of drawing. Draw from life, for example. I think that drawing from observation is probably the single best thing uh, you can do in order to improve your drawing skills and your visual thinking skills. Uh, because I've, it will teach you that drawing does not happen on the paper. You know, drawing happens in your head. Yeah. Uh, drawing is about observing something, understand what shapes makes the form you see, and finally tracing those shapes on paper. And I think you could just practice looking at something, try to understand the shapes, and not tracing anything on paper. And honestly, I think it still counts at pra practicing your drawing skills, you know? Uh, drawing from life uh, really teach you that drawing is first about seeing, about close observation. Uh, and you quickly realize uh, that the process is the same when you draw from imagination or when you visualize an abstract concept. We don't need our eyes to see or to observe something. Uh, this is, I think, the true magic of visual thinking when you think about it. Being able to see without actually looking at something or even being able to see things that don't have a, a, a physical form, processes, timelines, concepts. And I think that yeah, drawing from life is a great way to, to practice this and to, to realize this. Yeah, that would be my third tips. <laughs> sounds good. That sounds good. Um, just really soaking all that in and thinking, it was interesting you said, you know, drawing is really in your head. I think all of sketchnoting is, right? Because listening is in your head as well. So mm -hmm. all those things are really, the power is happening in your mind. And then you're just training. I can see there's frustration with people who are new 
when I teach that the the gap between what they see and what they want mm-hmm. to produce and what they're able to produce is a really wide gap, right? So anything you can do to bring what you're thinking and seeing closer to what you're able to produce makes you more satisfied. And that's a progress, right? You Like you say, the practice, the, the intentional practice really helps you bring those closer, every step closer, which is really great feedback. Thank you for, those are great tips. <laughs> you're welcome. So Adrian, tell us a little bit, how can we find you? So if, if you're someone who's never heard of Adrian before, and now you want to go look at work he's doing and and see the thing he's thinks he's up to. What's the best place to find you? Uh, well, I have a website, adrianliard.com. Uh, but the best place to connect with me is definitely Instagram. Uh, my account there is adrian.liard.sketchnotes. And, and do not hesitate to write me a message. Uh, this is actually what I enjoy the most on Instagram, start discussion with fellow visual thinker. Uh, I made really good friends that way. So this is this is all we connected to, Mike. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, I like to, as my friend Aleo from the Sketch Effect likes to put it, uh, yeah. it's good to bring back the social aspect into social media, yeah. you know? Uh, uh, yeah, I really enjoy sharing idea and advice with, with people from all over the world. So yeah, follow me on Instagram and let's start a, a discussion. Don't be shy. <laughs> mm, that's great to hear. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being on Adrian. It's been great to hear from you and hear your story and what you're up to and sort of your perspective and even your, your guidance and tips for people who just need a little bit of encouragement. Uh, thank you for being willing to take the time and share. It's been really great to have you on the show. Well, you're welcome. It was a real pleasure for me. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. And I'm uh, for everyone who's listening, this is another episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast. We're wrapping up. Until the next episode, we'll talk to you soon. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show. 